Greetings, brothers and sisters. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you all from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we are here again for Bible study and we welcome everybody who is participating this evening, whether you are in Jamaica or in the United States or Canada or wherever you are. We greet you in the name of the Lord. If you have been with us for a little while, you know we have been looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Our overarching subject is the sovereign God and the mystery of his will. And this evening we are beginning lesson 83 and um, we are looking at the subject, do not be deceived. Well, that is our theme for this evening's lesson, do not be deceived. Ephesians 5, 1 to 7 is our text, and I'll be reading in your hearing from the King James Version. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, or unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. And let us pray. Our Father, our Father who is in heaven, we thank you for yet another opportunity to listen to you speak to us through your word. Lord God, help us all to understand that the Bible is the veritable word of God the unadulterated word of God, and we must heed it if we are to live. Speak to us in a clear and certain way this evening. We commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Jesus Christ. We have been saying that in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul continues the exhortations he had begun in chapter 4 concerning how believers should live out their faith. In verses 1 and 2, he encourages the believers in Ephesus to imitate God since they are his beloved children. In verses 3 and 4, he transitions to condemn sexual immorality, well, sexual immor immoral action and speech. And he says that these things are totally inappropriate, totally inappropriate for persons who have put off the old man and have put on the new man. In verse 5, he writes, For this ye know, that no, no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor 
covetous man who is an idolater have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The New American Standard Bible furnish, furnishes the following translation. For this you know with certainty that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. In this verse, Paul makes it clear that persons who deliberately and persistently live in sin have no share in the kingdom of God. He reminds the believers in Ephesus that they themselves are absolutely convinced of the truth of this solemn conclusion. He says, for this ye know. The translation of the phrase by the New American Standard Bible is a more faithful rendering of the Greek. For this you know with certainty, with certainty. You know this. The phrase know with certainty is actually two verbs in the Greek. The first is oida, which refers to absolute positive knowledge, knowledge that is beyond a shadow of doubt. The second verb is ginosko, which refers to knowledge gained by experience. Paul uses two verbs, both of which speak of knowing to remind the believers in Ephesus of what they already knew beyond a shadow of doubt based on their own experience that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Brothers and sisters, Paul is saying here in no uncertain terms that a person's eternal destiny is directly related to his or her lifestyle. He's not arguing that a person's sins can cause him or her to lose his or her salvation. He's saying rather that a lifestyle of unrighteousness, unholy behavior is a reflection that one was never regenerated or saved. That's what he's saying. He's not saying that if we sin after we are saved, we can lose our salvation. He's saying that if our lifestyle is one of unrighteousness, if our lifestyle is one of unholy behavior, that is a reflection that we were never saved. Paul's exhortation deals with the habitual practice of sin, not with occasional acts of sin. We need to understand that. Brothers and sisters, are we persuaded beyond a shadow of doubt based on our own experience that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? We, like the Ephesian believers, need to be absolutely sure that this is indeed the case. We must not allow ourselves to be deceived. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, listen to what Paul writes. Do not be deceived. God will not be made a fool for a person will reap what he sows, because the person who sows to his own flesh 
will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. The New English translation. Hear me, my beloved brothers and sisters. If there has not been a significant change in our lifestyle, if there is no desire for God or for the things of God, then there is reason for us to seriously consider whether we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, whether we have truly been born again, whether we are indeed a new creation in Christ. As I have been saying, we are not speaking here of perfection. We are speaking of the general direction of our lives. In other words, where are we headed? In respect of this verse, Ray Stedman made the following comments, and I quote, Notice that he, that is Paul, takes up the same three categories he refers to in verse 3, immorality, impurity, and covetousness. As we have seen, covetousness here is not greed for money, as it is frequently in the scriptures, but is passion, greed for another's body, desire to possess another for exploitative use. Any man, he says, who practices immorality, impurity, or body greed, and he puts it flatly and bluntly, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. In other words, sexual looseness is incompatible with Christian faith because continuance in it reveals an unregenerate heart. Notice how he reinforces this. Be sure of this, he says. And he goes on in the next verse, do not let anyone deceive you about this. You cannot be a Christian and knowingly, deliberately practice sex outside of marriage for the one cancels out the other. Oh, I know a Christian can do these things. God knows the record is all too clear in this regard. Even in the scriptures, we have the account of David, who after years as a believer, as a man after God's own heart, fell into the sin of adultery and took another man's wife. We have other accounts of it in scripture, and there are plenty of modern examples. How often the Christian world is startled and shocked by some prominent pastor or other Christian leader who succumbs in this area and stumbles and falls into sexual immorality. I know this can happen, but the point, but the point sorry, the apostle is making is that no professed Christian can do this repeatedly certainly not defiantly or shamelessly and really be a Christian. The true Christian, if he does fall into this kind of folly, will abhor himself and loathe his sin and will repent and turn back and forsake it. The man who defends it and who justifies and excuses this kind of activity or even glories in it as some do as a mark of their personal liberty or freedom is in the light of this statement of the Apostle Paul not a Christian despite all his profession and he never has been a Christian. These are solemn, sobering 
words. Now Paul says that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Brothers and sisters, these sins describe who we were before we were regenerated. They should not be descriptive of who we are now. We have come out of the lifestyle characterized by these sins and we must not forget where that lifestyle is headed in regard to our eternal destiny. Let us consider the following related passages of scripture, all reflecting the rendering of the New English translation. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. There it is again. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, the verbally abusive and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here Paul is saying it again. He says this in the epistles that he writes to the congregations, to the saints. Some of you once lived this way. Notice that. Some of you once lived this way. So, as Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians, as he's writing these words in his mind's eye, he is thinking about some of the members of the church in Corinth who used to live this way, who were guilty of these sins. And he says, some of you once lived that way, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That was once. It shouldn't be happening now. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And although you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you formerly lived, according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the domain of the ear, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us also formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in offenses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. So we were dead. And when we were in a state of deadness, these terrible sins characterized our lives. But now we have been made alive with Christ. And he raised us up together with him and seated us together with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus to demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his creative work. Having been created in Christ Jesus 
for good works that God prepared beforehand so we can do them. We have been created for good works. God has prepared the good works beforehand that we should do them. I love 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 to 10. We know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. We know, Paul says, we know that you are God's elect. How does Paul know that? In that, our gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction Surely you recall the character we displayed when we came among you to help you. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. This is a remarkable statement. Paul is saying, you imitated me. When you were saved, he says, first of all, your conversion was not that of a mere profession. Your lives were altered. There was a demonstrable change in the way you lived. And he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In other words, what Paul is saying, we, I, Paul, was imitating Christ so much I was living so much like Christ that when you imitated me, you were imitating Christ. That's a remarkable statement. You became imitators of us and of the Lord when you received the message with joy that comes from the Holy Spirit despite great affliction. As a result, watch this. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For from you, the message of the Lord has echoed forth, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. Reports of your faith in God have spread so that we do not need to say anything. Paul says, I don't even have to say a word about you. The reports of the way you live have gone abroad. For people everywhere report how you welcomed us and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, our deliverer from the coming wrath. You understand that, brothers and sisters? It was, as I said, demonstrable. This turning from sin and turning to God, they left their idols. And they were now serving the true and living God. This was not just a testimony time. This was not just talking about what God had done. It was clear to everybody that these persons had been saved. And when Paul says in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, that waiting isn't a passive waiting. That waiting means being in readiness, looking eagerly, expectantly for the return of Jesus Christ. That is what that waiting there means. So you see, brothers and sisters, there must be a change in our lifestyle. We cannot continue living the way we were. And if these sins characterize our lives and there has been no change, then we really have to seriously question the genuineness of our conversion. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. So, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you also arm yourselves with the same 
attitude because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. In that, he spends the rest of his time on earth concerned about the will of God and not human desires for the time that has passed was sufficient for you to do what the non-Christians desire. You live then in debauchery, evil desires, drunkenness, carousing, drinking bouts, and wanton idolatries for the time that has passed. The time has passed. We used to do these things. So they are astonished when you do not rush with them into the same flood of wickedness and they vilify you, your former companions. Those who you used to carouse with and drink with and attend these wild parties, they are still doing it and they are wondering, they are amazed that you don't do these things anymore. There has been a change. The change has been so dramatic that now they vilify you, they criticize you, they talk about you in a negative way because you are so dramatically different. Peter says they will face a reckoning before Jesus Christ who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Brothers and sisters, if we were to take an inventory of our spiritual lives in respect of, say, the last few months, what would we discover? Could we describe our life as one which is trending upward or headed in a Godward direction? Are we diligently pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we increasingly living above sin? Is our love for God and for each other increasing? Is our love for sin decreasing? In other words, are we generally making progress notwithstanding occasional sinful lapses? How is it with us? When last have we taken our spiritual temperature? It's more important to take inventory of our spiritual lives, to take our spiritual temperature than to take temperature in terms of seeing whether we have the COVID-19 disease or not. Paul encourages believers to periodically examine themselves. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he writes, put yourself to the test to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize regarding yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? New English translation. Commenting on Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5, the American theologian and radio minister J. Vernon McGee made the following remarks. It is clearly understood that the unregenerate man who practices these sins has no portion in the kingdom of Christ and God. If a professing Christian practices these sins, he immediately classifies himself. No matter what his testimony may be on Sunday or what position he may have in the church, such a person is saying to the lost world that he is not a child of God. Brothers and sisters, I have been trying to say to us, I have been desperately trying to get us to understand that in examining ourselves, in taking our spiritual temperature, we should not go back 
to a speaking in tongues experience. Either when we initially were saved or within recent times. That is what we tend to do. We look for the last time that we spoke in tongues and then we say, oh, it hasn't happened since then. And we believe that, you know, if we have spoken in tongues in the past, that is evidence that we were originally saved. I have been telling us, not so. Not so. You notice that none of the apostles, none of the writers of the epistles ever, ever in dealing with examining oneself and testing one's spiritual temperature, none of them speak about any experience. They never mention any experience. They always go back to lifestyle. I don't know what it is with us why we are so hung up on experiences when the Bible writers, the Word of God, place no great emphasis on these things. People will say, when you ask them, how is your spiritual life, you will say to them, when last did you speak in tongues? What does that matter? Are you living above sin? That's what matters. Are you having the victory? In verse 6, Paul writes, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. If I am speaking in tongues and living like a devil, the wrath of God is coming upon me. The New American Standard Bible translates the verse as follows. See that no one deceives you with empty words. For because of these things, what are the, these things that Paul is talking about? Let's read verse 5 again. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The, the sense of this negative command is very well expressed in the Amplified Bible. Listen to this. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments that encourage you to sin. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, those who habitually sin. Regarding this verse, John MacArthur writes the following, No Christian will be sinless in this present life. But it is dangerously deceptive for Christians to offer assurance of salvation to a professing believer whose life is characterized by persistent sin and who shows no shame for that sin or hunger for the holy and pure things of God. Brothers and sisters, I have had to deal with persons who, who have found themselves, you know, engaged in committing horrible sins, not just sexual sins, but just horrible sins. And what I have watched for is that sense of shame, that remorse, that brokenness, that tells me more about the genuineness of their Christian experience than anything else. Anything else. The, the nature of their sin does not scare me. What scares me is if there is no repentance, no sign of being sorry, because then I have to wonder if Christ was ever there. You understand what I'm saying? 
In my own life, this is what I look for. The word deceive is the translation of the Greek word apatao, which means to lead astray, mislead, cheat, delude, beguile, seduce into error. The idea is to cause someone to have misleading or erroneous views concerning the truth. The word is in a construction in the Greek which forbids the continuation of an action already taking place. It is apparent that some of the Ephesian believers were justifying their continuance in a sinful, immoral lifestyle by allowing themselves to be deceived into thinking that they could do so and still profess to be saved. Paul is warning them, stop allowing yourselves to be deceived. John Piper comments as follows, and I quote, What does the deceiver say? Who do you think it is today that does what the deceiver does in verse 6? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. I would answer, says Piper, that the deceiver is the person today who says that gospel obedience can't be motivated by these words in verses 5 and 6. The deceiver is the person who says that the preaching of wrath belongs only to the law and produces only legalistic fear. That is not true. If it were true, Paul wouldn't warn his readers, professing Christians, about the danger of falling short of the kingdom and falling under the final wrath of God. The point of introducing the wrath of God and the danger of missing out on the kingdom of Christ is not to enslave people to unwilling and burdensome obedience. The point is this, evangelical obedience from a renewed mind and a heart brimming with joy and thanksgiving is not optional. Jesus said the same thing in John 3.3, 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This kind of warning is not a summons to legalistic fear and slavish cowering obedience. Just the opposite. Both Jesus and Paul are warning us that getting rid of your legalistic fear and getting rid of your slavish efforts to obey God is infinitely serious. In other words, we need to get rid of those things. They are saying that it, it is a matter of eternal importance whether you are really renewed in the spirit of your mind and whether you are really born again and really full of gratitude and joy and freedom in your obedience. When God reveals his truth, his intention is not to contradict or hinder the gospel motives of faith and freedom and joy. Just the opposite. The revelation of his wrath is the intention intensification of his demand that we trust in his mercy and delight in his grace. End of quote. Vain or empty words. Let no man deceive you with vain words or empty words or empty arguments. Vain or empty words refer to arguments that are devoid of truth 
and which are therefore worthless. They may sound plausible and even wise, but they are without any genuine spiritual content. In the context of this verse, these arguments represent false excuses for sins. False excuses for sins. I have heard professing Christians justify watching pornography and saying it will help them in their sexual relationships with their spouses. In Jude 3 and 4, Jude writes about persons who are satanically inspired to deceive others with empty arguments. The New English translation renders the verses as follows. Dear friends, although I have been eager to write to you about our common salvation, I now feel compelled instead to write to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men have secretly slipped in among you, men who long ago were marked out for the condemnation I am about to describe, ungodly men who have turned the grace of our God into a license for evil and who deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, the only way you can twist, the only way you can turn the grace of God into a license for evil, a license to sin, is by denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. That's the only way I can do it. If I deny that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Master, once I have denied that, then now the door is open for me to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. But once Christ is my Lord and Master, I can never do that with His grace. The vast majority of persons in modern society are adopting an increasingly lenient and tolerant attitude towards sexual immorality. They argue that the gratification of sexual appetites is needful and beneficial and that to repress these appetites is harmful. They say that morals are entirely a matter of the culture in which we live and that since premarital, extramarital, homosexual and lesbian sex are increasingly accepted in our culture, they ought not to be denounced. Unfortunately, some of the leading empty argument spokespersons are persons who claim to be Christians, some of whom hold prominent positions in their churches. My brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, do not be deceived because the word of God informs us that because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It is because of immorality, impurity, covetousness, and idolatry that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The renowned Princeton theologian of the 19th century, Charles Hodge, explains that the wrath of God is a fearful expression because the wrath of man 
is the disposition to inflict evil limited by man's feebleness, whereas the wrath of God is the, is the determination to punish in a being without limit, either as to his presence or power. This wrath, Paul says, comes upon the children of disobedience. The wrath of God against these sins is now manifested in his dealings with those who commit them. He withdraws his restraining influence from them and finally he gives them over to a reprobate mind. We will conclude our lesson with comments from Ligonier Ministries on the verses we have considered this evening. I quote, John Calvin in his commentary on Ephesians 5, 3 to 5, offers the church a helpful reminder of the difference between repentant sinners and those who obstinately continue in their transgressions. He writes, when men have repented, Repented and thus give evidence that they are reconciled to God. They are no longer the same persons that they formerly were. But let all fornicators or unclean or covetous persons, so long as they continue such, be assured that they have no friendship with God and are deprived of all hope of salvation. There is a difference between those who profess Christ, seek to mortify the flesh, and occasionally sin, and those who profess Christ but celebrate their sin. The latter group, the impenitent, has no share in the Lord's kingdom. On the other hand, Jesus receives with open arms those who hate their evil doing, even if they sometimes fall. 1 John 1, 8-9 Let us always remember this when we consider Scripture's teaching on the fate of the sexually immoral. Only the sons of disobedience receive the wrath of God. Ephesians 5, 6. Sons typically bear many of the physical and personality traits of their parents. Thus, the sons of disobedience have their father's nature. They reflect their lineage consistently relishing their sin, even demanding that others approve of it. These individuals show no desire for repentance, and they have no place in Christ's body. Converted people, however, have become children of God. John, John 1, 12, they are part takers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4, and are being slowly conformed to it over their lifetimes. Such individuals resist temptation, hate it when they sin, and never seek approval for their transgressions. We gladly welcome these men and women in our churches, for they are recovering sinners just like us, just like us. Today, many churches look the other way when there are cohabiting unmarried couples in the congregation. Entire denominations consecrate impenitent homosexuals as pastors. These are examples of those who attempt to deceive the church with empty words, words devoid of gospel truth. Ephesians 5, 6. 
They are engaged in a deadly business, providing false assurance to many and, re and rejecting Jesus' demand for faith and repentance, Mark 1, 14 to 15. If these leaders continue in their lies, they have a dreadful judgment awaiting them. James chapter 3 and verse 1. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. O oh God, our oh God, hear us this evening in your mercy and forgive us for our many transgressions. Lord, we are again weighed in the balances and found wanting. Help us, Lord. Help those of us who profess Christianity never to be indifferent about our sin, never to joke about it, Help us always to be broken. Help us always to grieve greatly when we fall into sin. Help us never to try to justify ourselves. Help us never to say it is because of such and such. Help us, Lord, just to throw our hands up and say, I have sinned as your servant David did many years ago. O oh God, undoubtedly there are persons who have heard us this evening who are overtaken, who are enmeshed in some of these very sins, but who hate their sin and who hate what their sin is doing to them. O oh Lord, in your mercy, deliver them. In your mercy, break, O oh God, the power of indwelling sin in their lives. Help them to understand that indeed this is what you have done and they are now free to serve you. Help us all, Lord, for all of us come short of your glory. There is none of us who attend the Grace Workshop ministries who can hold up our hands and say we are guiltless, not one. Help us this evening, Lord. We commit ourselves to you. It is our desire to be pure. And we know that your Holy Spirit is working in our lives to bring us to that place. Finally, Lord, if there is one or two or several who have heard us this evening and they have been pretending to be saved. If they, Lord, are doubting their situation, rescue them, Lord. Reach down and rescue them. Help those of us who are hypocrites to repent and help those of us who are struggling to take comfort in the fact that you know of our struggles but help us never to excuse our behavior. We commit ourselves into your hands this evening and give you thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.